Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Financial Advisors Workshop. Financial Advisors Workshop is the show where we talk to financial advisors of all types uh, and how they started their business and what kind of business that they're in and how they serve their clients. Today, we have a very interesting character named Andy Sinclair. And Andy's from Wisconsin, the great land of cheese and uh, land of the great Green Bay Packers and all those great things. And uh, he's here to talk to us about real estate. He's an investment advisor that focuses on real estate. Andy, welcome to the Financial Advisor Workshop. Yeah, Brian, thank you for having me on and happy to talk a little more about the market. Absolutely. So when you talk about the market, you're not talking about the typical market of like a financial advisor working at Merrill Lynch or UBS. You're talking about the real estate market. Yeah, and even more specifically, we're talking about the private real estate market um, and so everything that goes with the buildings, uh, from apartments to warehouse buildings to office buildings, uh, but certainly always have a, a side eye on what's going on in the bond and stock market. Exactly. And there's, there's competing factors between different markets. So people might buy real estate when stocks are uh, unattractive or vice versa, right? So there's always an element of competition there, isn't there? Could not agree more with that. Great. So Andy, tell us, how did you get started? You run Midlock Partners, but let's let's go back in, 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 uh, yeah, in the yeah. vault. How did you get started in this business and, and, and how did you lead up to where you are now? Yeah, so I've been in the business here for a number of years, Brian, and I either had the good luck or misfortune of starting my career in, um, in 2008. And so while I wasn't very deep into my career, I do remember, um, I do remember what happened in 2008. And I uh, am fortunate to have learned a lot of those lessons and definitely saw what happened in 2009, 2010, 2011. So I started at the very bottom, Brian. Um, and I was a guy that hung leasing signs in buildings, uh, worked for a leasing team. Uh, they sometimes call it a runner, essentially got anything a broker needed. And in those days, not a lot of transactions were going on. So there was a lot of requests. Uh, but I went from there, Brian, to go work for a legendary figure uh, named Bill Palmer. Bill was the leading brokerage team for a group called CBRE. CBRE is the uh, essentially usually considered the largest real estate or brokerage service firm in the world. And Bill led their largest by dollar volume brokerage team and learned a ton of good lessons, had a great track record and run working on the brokerage side. Uh, but similar to a lot of people, you eventually don't want to be the car salesman that sells the Ferrari. You want to be the person um, that's on the buy side, as they might say, in finance, that's doing the active investments. So as painful as it was after a good run, I left Palmer Capital to go work for uh, a different investment firm prior to co-founding Midlock. So you started at Palmer Capital and what did they do? Yeah, so Palmer Capital specialized in what's known in the business as investment sales brokerage. And they, being more specific, typically did sales between $30 million of property value and about $200 million. It's a wide range. In mm -hmm. the real estate space, that would be what's known as the large cap, right? So small, just similar to stocks and bonds, you have small and medium cap, large cap. Uh, a lot of people have different definitions of where the demarcation line is. Uh, but Palmer did a little bit of medium cap at 30 million and up, and then a lot of large cap at you know 50, 75 million dollar deals and up. So worked actively as an on an investment sales brokerage team. Uh, and I was the young man on the totem pole at that point, Brian. So I got a lot of the listings that people didn't want, you know, including one deal in particular. I got a, a foreclosure in Valencia, California. And I still think about this deal and I look back on it. Uh, no one wanted it. None of the brokers wanted to touch it, or at least the senior guys. So as the young guy, I got that. And you learn a lot of lessons working on tough deals coming out of the financial crisis. Uh, that deal went from 100% occupancy. It was built in you know 2010 down to practically zero, at least to Home Goods and Panda Express and a few other tenants, not much after that. And I was determined uh, to take care of the guys who took care of me. And eventually found a buyer and got the bank out of it. But, you know, you learn a lot of lessons from when times are bad. So you know how to act when times are good. So tell us about times that were bad. Are you referring back to 2008, 2009 and that whole era? 
Yeah, I would say, and, and keep in mind, Brian, my career was just taking off as the financial crisis was unfolding. And so I definitely saw a lot of outcomes. And, and you know, what happened in the great financial crisis, obviously, you had a lot of liquidity evaporate, a lot of poor underwriting, and it took a lot of years to that work through the system. Um, and so a lot of the deals from the financial crisis, foreclosures, distress, you know, or just deals that, you know, had ticking time bombs in their loans, they didn't really get unraveled till 2013, 2015, 2016 in some cases. And so definitely saw a lot of lessons, um, you know, things that we still preach today at Midlock, which is being careful about, you know, how much debt you have, you know, your balance sheet, as we would say, being careful about how much cash you keep on hand, and then having a really solid business plan. You know, I sometimes, Brian, even though we're now 15 years here later, there's sometimes things I see in the marketplace, and we talked about it before the show, that pops back up. It's almost like people forgot what happened only 15, 20 years ago and how it can quickly, history can uh, doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. It can, for sure. So what were some of the lessons of that era, uh, just the over leverage and, and hubris and everything else? Yeah, I think there's a few things. I mean, certainly capital structure, I think, is a big thing. And what I mean by that, which is who's your lender and what, you know, what are the terms? Um, and so the big thing, and it's not as prevalent as it was then, was what was known as commercial mortgage-backed securities or CMBS in the real estate world, essentially bond securitization of uh, loans for real estate. Now, those have largely, um, they're still part of the space. They still play a vital role in the markets and liquidity but they're not as prevalent as they were in 05, 06, 07, 08. Now, a lot of those lenders went on, and we can talk more about this, to become different types of lenders. And so some of the bad behavior uh, didn't go away. It just maybe got uh, you know quieted for a little bit. So I think being really careful about who your lender is and viewing them as a partner is a big thing. Um, and then I think, you know, more importantly, which is what do you believe your you know realistic underwriting projections are? You know, I think a lot of people thought they were just going to buy buildings. They were going to double in value. And, you know, that just didn't happen. You know, so I think it's having a business plan for when times are bad. And, you know, I see a lot of parallels to what's going on with, you know, COVID and now into interest rate hikes that here in the year 2022 and 2023. There's a lot of parallels that people just forgot those lessons and maybe got a little greedy. Yeah. Well, and COVID caused a lot of disruption. Maybe you can cover that and what that meant now for the real estate market as it is now. Yeah, I think what's interesting is the Fed started hiking rates in 2018, trying to get ahead of almost what would be the next crisis. And, you know, we don't have to spend too much time on, you know, what happened next with the Fed cutting rates very rapidly into COVID and injecting record money into the system with, uh, with you know, with stimulus dollars. What that did, though, was it injected a lot of liquidity and raised asset prices. Banks, if we look at one type of lenders, banks were flush with deposits and you had people, borrowers or investors, flush with cash to go invest. You know, And so that fled into asset prices rising pretty rapidly, inflation rising pretty rapidly. And I think if you fast forward today, the Fed obviously didn't have a lot of great choices. You know, one thing, Brian, though, I consider myself a student of investments as well as a student of uh, history. And so one of the first things I did in 2022 is I went out and bought two books. Uh, the first one was Paul Volcker's uh, autobiography uh, that he uh, wrote. And he talked a lot about how he approached inflation and hikes. Uh, and then there's another book that I'm happy to recommend to your group, which is The History of the Market in Five Crashes. And yeah. it's a great book. It's a great read. It is stock market related, but it talks about going back into the 1800s to really 2008, what's going on. And I will tell you the biggest lesson, and this is true of any crisis, when liquidity is needed the most, that is when uh, people need it. So, and that's when you can't get it. So you got to be liquid when you least expect it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. So, so I, I, I noted something that you pointed out that was different in 2008, 2009, and the periods just before that, the last real estate meltdown. 
um, credit was tight and cash dried up. But you said this time there was so much money around. And that was uh, why? Because government money and PPP and all that. Yeah, a combination of that. PPP, you know, I mean, stimulus to keep in mind if the government sent, you know, the everyday American a check, well, they probably put that into savings. You know, the the Fred, which is the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, has some great charts that we, you know, I'd recommend anybody to go check out the money supply. You know, from 2019, 2020, kind of went like this, and then 2020 uh, hit, and it went like that. And just now, are we starting to see it round up ever so slightly? So, if the money supply was here, it's only got back to here. And so, I think that there was just everyone was flush with cash and. You're seeing in the news, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, I think they thought the deposits were going to last a long time uh, and they can go very quickly. And that's something to be careful about. They had yeah. a good old fashioned bank run. There we go. So then you had another interim stop before you started Midlock Partners and you did how many deals there? Four deals? Oh, I did a lot of deals there. I worked on four funds. Um, so I used to be the vice president of private equity at a group called MLG Capital out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and they were a much, much smaller group when I went to go work for them. Um, and I spent a lot of time not only doing investments, but also working on the fund creation and investor relations side. Um, it's kind of rare these days that you get an opportunity to, uh, you know, do both parts of the job. Uh, most people are specialists, but I did both when I was MLG and had a great track record of investing in deals and working with clients. Um, you know, MLG has been blessed to have great growth uh, and great, uh, great growth in where they're buying their assets. And so their specialty was small to middle market. And how I would typically define that as any real estate building valued between 5 million and 50. Um, what someone one time joked to me, so you mean no skyscrapers or ultra big buildings, which is true. A lot of normal sized buildings, right? Typically in the small to bit of market, that's where you can get asymmetrical information. Um, and so I had a great track record doing that for MLG and they still do play in that space, but also added a large cap feature. And um, I moved on to co-found Midlock and really be dedicated to the private equity real estate space doing the small to middle market. And that's where I am today. All right. So tell us, why are you doing the small and middle market now instead of the big high rent? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I will tell you, everyone likes the sound of a large cap. Um, and I'll give you an analogy. I had a mentor one time tell me, which is it looks really sexy, sounds really cool. You hope to make some money when you sell, right? Kind of like a sports team. Looks really sexy, sounds really cool. It costs a lot of money to run it. And then you hope you make some money when it sells. You know, the small to middle market, um, and these are everyday size buildings, right? Apartments, warehouse buildings. And you know, one of my favorite buildings had a, in Cincinnati, I bought a warehouse building. It had the manufacturer made the peanut butter jars for like Jif and, uh, and Skippy, right? And these are normal businesses that are in these type of buildings. You know, retail buildings, you know, Starbucks, FedEx office, Target, all these normal type tenants. They're in the small to middle market. Those are the space they occupy. The reason I'm in that space is because it's too inefficient for the large investors, such as a pension fund, Wall Street, insurance company, a public REIT. They don't have time to go buy $10 million properties. They just don't. It's too inefficient for them. They need to put out a billion dollars a month in some cases. They need to do big deals or a lot of deals. It's all about volume. And on the other side, it's too big for the everyday investor, people that buy duplexes, fourplexes, strip centers, you know, self-storage facilities. And, you know, that's why we play in that space. It's just inefficient, but inefficiency leads to greater rates of return. And my team, we like to bring some professionalism to what is sometimes a cowboy industry in that small to middle market. You know, that can include bringing um, green incentives or you know, or looking to lease up a building that was previously unoccupied. And so we, every deal we do, Brian, we like to unlock value by having two to three ways to make money because that is a hedge on the market going up, up and up. It's having an actual business plan to create value. Nice. So, and, and as far as like the middle markets and the smaller deals, you see greater opportunity. And do you, do you do it in large markets or do you do it in secondary or tertiary markets? 
Yeah, it's a combination. So half of what we do, Brian, uh, and what our focus is, I would say, is the Midwest. Um, sometimes we joke internally and call it the mid-best. Um, so another half is in other markets. Now, everything we do, though, you want to be a little bit careful. You know, I've owned historically uh, in many markets around the country, but some of the markets I love are markets like Madison, Wisconsin, or the Twin Cities in Minnesota or Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, not to say I don't like Phoenix, Arizona, and Dallas, Texas, because we've owned there. Um, don't own in Phoenix right now. But those markets, even though they're always ranked as the best place to live and this, that, the other thing, they're very boom or bust. You know, and the right. sexier they sound, your light bulbs sh should go off in your head to say, okay, but is there is it is this an old-fashioned gold rush? Are people just rushing into those markets because they're told they should put money in Dallas or in Orlando, Florida? And that can lead to a lot of spec speculation. And, you know, in this case, I heard from an investor earlier today rapid price drop in phoenix you know i mean the price in phoenix has been cut in half you know that's not the case in madison wisconsin which has great growth fundamentals great population growth but doesn't have the boom or bust aspect that you might see in some other markets so combination but a focus on what i would call unloved but very normal markets so um tell me what some of those are yeah, um, some of the markets that I either invested in now or previously invested in include, you know, Minneapolis and St. Paul and all the surrounding suburbs of the, those markets, Madison, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, you know, Cincinnati, Columbus, you know, um, parts of, you know, it's even though it's considered a larger tier market, parts of Charlotte, North Carolina, you know, Denver, Colorado. And occasionally we'll do a deal as well in a sexy market like a Dallas or Orlando, both good markets that we own in. But when we do a sexy market, we're extra careful. You got to be, you know, you might have some good population growth, but there's also 10 other people with a crane in the sky looking to build. So you got to be a little more careful. You got supply issues. So what do you, what do you think about doing smaller properties in the major markets, New York, LA, Chicago? Yeah, I think the major markets, they're they're going to get through their cycles. You know, right now, the headlines have been all pretty negative on New York City, San Francisco, L.A., you know, New York City to a, a lesser degree because people are moving maybe out of those cities. San Francisco has had the dual effect of uh, venture capital and tech firms leaving the city um, and some, you know, I would argue some uh, some political unrest, L.A. similar. Right. These are sunshine areas. People want to live in L.A., um, New York, the, the you know, titans of capitalism are there. But that doesn't mean they're always perfect. So I think they're going to survive, Brian, and they're going to make it through just fine. But I think it's definitely a low period for them. You know, the headlines have really been dominated by groups like Brookfield, who is one of the largest real estate firms in the world. They're they're getting foreclosed upon. So just because you're bigger doesn't always mean you're better. Yeah. Well, good. Well, uh, so you seem to have a direction and opinion and where you're going with this and, and, uh, how, how have the investors done so far in your program? Yeah. So we target a, a couple of things, Brian. So we target both cash flow and then upside, you know, from an annual distribution, which is similar to a dividend, we target, you know, five to 10% on a per property basis. You know, we obviously have some that do much better, uh, but try to hit a consistent five to 10% dividend. And then we try to um, also capture upside, which is a little bit different from appreciation, of making us all in return of 14 to 18%. Um, historically, Brian, we've done better than that. You know, our track record in our previous fund, the average return is pushing about 60% plus. Obviously, those numbers are something we would not fundraise upon. We would want people to expect a little bit lower rate of return. Um, we're certainly going to try to hit those every time. But you don't want to expect you're always going to hit a home run. Um, but to hit those numbers consistently, you have to stick to your guns, which is being careful on your leverage, having more cash than you think you need, and also, um, you know, at the same time, being really consistent in how you underwrite deals. And so that's how we've gone about it. Um, and I think, lastly, it's easy to get caught up in the hype and the hoopla, but I think it's also being careful what your asset allocation is in these deals. And so we work a lot of time on what is portfolio management 
What goes into the fund? Does it fit? Is this the right thing for investors to be in? And that takes time. Yes, it does. Interesting. Well, um, so your model of return is like a combination of income and growth, right? Walk me through that. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, we call ourselves a value investor, Brian. You know, most people I argue in the real estate industry, and I apologize for my fellow real estate investors, but that frankly, there's a lot of people, they're just speculators. You know, they bank on bad underwriting and hot markets and think that the rent will go up, up and up and that the market will never drop. You know, we know that's not true. History has proven that time and time again. And so Midlock, we're really looking for discrepancies. I sometimes joke on our apartment deals and we do both apartments and commercial. We're looking for a reversion of the mean, something where we can buy at a discount or rent that's out of sync, something where we can do a few things and re uh, get it back in sync. Um, and so that's, I think the best way to do it is to try to be a little careful. Um, the reason I say a value investor is if we do two or three things, we're going to create appreciation or value creation. If the market appreciates, that's just a cherry on top. But that's not our sole business plan. Like a lot of investors. Okay. So it's a combination of income and growth. And, and that's uh, a real benefit of being in real estate. How much um, leverage do you employ in the fund you run? Yeah, so we typically, and for frame of reference, people buy their homes plus or minus 80%, right? For a traditional U.S. mortgage, you know, we target 65%, but I can tell you in our current fund that we're investing out of, we're even lower today. We're only at 43% debt. So we're at historic lows and on purpose, we've held too much cash, Brian, We've kept our assets intentionally low, in some cases amortizing, you know, favoring fixed debt versus floating debt, you know, not working with hedge fund lenders, you know, favoring Fannie Mae banks, insurance companies as our lenders. These are all things, by the way, that would have uh, people would have told me were out of style just 12 months ago. You know, people would have been doing all these things. Um, but they didn't. They were taking a lot of risky loans, and that was never my cup of tea. So our leverage point's a lot lower than theirs. I just don't think the extra leverage re leads to better returns and better outcomes. Because what you might pick up in financial engineering, you give right back in risk and reward. And it's just not worth it. You might get lucky every once in a while. I'll give you an example of a deal where we turned it down and we had a killer deal next to the airport in Charlotte that we were going to invest in. Great warehouse building, um, you know, A minus building. And we were going to fix it up. And our, our co-development partner um, was going to be the lead leasing team, and they held the contract, which means they had the right to buy it, and we were going to be the co-partner on it. And we had everything teed up, but they wanted to put on, this is in January of this year, of January 2023, they wanted to put a loan on it with a hedge fund and then put a mezzanine piece on it. And I said, hey, I will offer to invest more money in the building to get a better lender with less um, contention. And all I ever heard was pitched on was, well, we're gonna make a lot of money with this loan structure. And I said, I don't care. I don't wanna make more money and put everyone at risk. I'd rather us have less debt, sleep well at night and make a moderate amount of money. And that's where I think people get greedy. You know, They get these, uh, these, these big eyes and they think it's gonna be all great, but they gotta be careful. That's one thing as a professional investment manager, you know, you only get one shot to take care of people's money. So you got to do it right. Exactly. Well, good. So tell us what you think the next real estate trends are. We are talking, we're talking commercial, mid-sized commercial. What are the, what are the trends you see that you'd like to take advantage of to help investors? Yeah, I'll give you a few trends we're seeing right now in the marketplace. This might run a little counterintuitive um, or stuff that maybe you've heard. I will tell you right now we're seeing industrial uh, with warehouse buildings having excellent rent growth nationally. Um, very similar to how apartments had their run in the 2010s and a little bit of the, you know, the 2000s. We're seeing a similar case study in warehouse buildings in terms of their rent growth. Uh, and um, one thing I would say goes along with both that and on the apartment side as well, is we're seeing developers really pull back. You know, developers, even though the pricing is coming down to build a building, you're just not seeing people build. Interest rates are high. You know, 
construction costs are high, investors are scared. And so because of that, it puts more demand on the existing buildings, which can sometimes lead to rental increases. Um, additionally, I will tell you, despite what you read on the news, retail is not distressed. And some of our retail buildings are some of our best performers. Now, maybe your mall down the street, that may not make it. But if you've went to Starbucks or went to the post office or FedEx office or you know Trader Joe's, whatever, you probably saw a pretty full parking lot. So I think retail will continue to have strong demand and nobody's building it because they're afraid. And then lastly, I think office is going through a tough time, but I do think if you give it three to four years, it's a contrarian play, um, but I think you're going to see people um, come back to the office. Work from home will exist. So the question is, to what level is work from home? Are you in three days, two days, four days? That's going to be every employer's individual decision. But you might need less space, but the rents are going to go up because they need to they need essentially reconfigure the space. So you're going to pay a premium per foot for less space. Um, that's one thing we're just starting to see the trends on nationally here on office rents, counterintuitive to what you, you think you might be hearing. So um, and then lastly, and this is a national trend, I do see apartment pricing pulling back. You know, Midlock last year, we were buying more warehouse buildings and apartments were at their absolute peak. This year, we've been buying more apartments because the pricing's pulled back, kind of running the other way of where people run, you know, running uh, to the fire versus away from it. So um, I think it's going to be um, a lot of stuff's going to happen here in the next 24 months. And we're actively have our fingers in a lot of distressed deals, but you know, some people just aren't distressed enough yet. So remains to be seen what the next crisis will be and if the Fed will cause it here with interest rate hikes. Do you think we're going to have a bad recession? I think it's going to be a moderate recession. I think the stock market and the bond market is underpricing the risk of where the Fed will do. You know, one I mentioned earlier, I'm a less, uh, you know, someone who tries to learn from history, a student of history. Paul Volcker didn't stop raising rates when he met inflation, he kept going. I do believe the Fed is not going to just cut rates here, you know, in May of 2023 or June of 2023. I think they're going to put the fire out a little more. You know, you don't just put water on the fire and walk away. You want to douse it. And so I would be ready for people that are in bonds or in stocks that there's probably going to be a rise in yields, even more so than what's happening. You know, I also will tell you to be ready for the money supply to continue to shrink. And what does that mean for your local or regional lender? It means they're probably lacking deposits, you know? And so I think that a lot of those things mean we're in for a recession. How severe? I, I just don't know. Don't oh, know. Okay. Interesting. Well, we're coming kind of to the end of our time here, Andy, and I just wanted to see, is there... Is there a message you can send the investors who are watching this program? Um, you know, what what do you think is an important thing to remember going forward uh, from your work? And and then uh, what message would you like to send everybody about it? Yeah, I think one thing is um, I just had this conversation with an investor who was talking about the S and P five hundred and stocks and bonds versus real estate, and I think real estate can be an excellent complement in your portfolio. I'm not saying don't invest in stocks, don't invest in bonds. I think it's a nice in addition to, you know, everyone's going to have a different risk tolerance than, you know, perhaps I do in real estate, you know, whether that's 5% or 30% of your portfolio, I don't know. That's your own decision. But I think the takeaway is I wouldn't be afraid to add real estate and I would be really careful who your operator is. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone like Blackstone. You know, it could be a medium-sized operator or a smaller boutique operator like Midlock. And so I think if you do that, it will help diversify away your volatility and your risk. Um, you know, the S&P 500 since January of 2022 is down. I mentioned it, um, you know, before the show started, you're down about 10% on the S&P since January of last year. So we've got 18 months with negative returns. Real estate isn't necessarily negative returns if you have cash flow, you know, and you've done stuff to create value. So I think it's an excellent in addition to, uh, and lastly, we didn't even mention it, but there's a lot of other great reasons to have it, which is income, yield, um, you know, depreciation. I think there's a lot of fabulous benefits, but that's a 
that's the next podcast. That's further reading material. So excellent. Well, this is great. Thanks for your insights in the real estate markets. And uh, we'll, we'll look to uh, see what Midlock is doing, um, you know, in, in the future and uh, come back and get some more ideas from you about trends in the real estate markets. All right, Andy. Yeah. And lastly, I will say, um, you know, we're a homer for our Midwestern markets. I think for the next five years, you're going to see a trend is a lot of people are going to put money in the Midwest and away from some of the coastal sexy markets. So we're excited to have everyone come join us. No, wonderful. Well, good. Being here in Chicago, in the, the, the top city in the Midwest, we're hoping for that revival as well. Likewise. Thank you. All right, Andy. Well, thanks. Thanks for being with us today on the Today's Market Explained, the Four Star Podcast. And uh, we'll leave it there, everybody, for the whole Four Star team uh, and, and for Andy Sinclair. We're signing off for today. Thanks. Thank you for having me.